everybody, it's Matt from Eastwood Company, and welcome to another live broadcast where we're going to teach you about Eastwood tools and give you a little bit of knowledge. If you guys haven't watched one of our live broadcasts before, we try to make them um, as interactive as possible. So we have over uh, at the desk here at the side, Randy, you see in a lot of our videos, he's on the computer. He's going to be chatting with you guys, answering any questions you may have immediately about um, any of the topics that we talk about. Um, if you have any questions you'd like us to answer live on air, shoot them to Randy, and then he's going to give them over to me, and I'll try to do my best to answer them on camera. Make sure you like, share, comment, do everything like that. We can get as many people watching us as we can, and again, make it as interactive as possible. So today, the topic that we have is diagnosing MIG welds. Uh, a common thing that we get uh, in our call center and to our tech line is uh, people that call in that maybe are first-time welders or just got their MIG welder and they're having some trouble get laying down a nice weld. And a lot of times, um, Scott and team in the tech line, they talk people through it and it ends up just being their settings are incorrect or maybe they interpreted um, some of the settings on the machine incorrectly. And really the welder is not a problem, it's just setting it up. So I'm gonna teach you how to diagnose your welds here and a couple quick steps. And it's usually one of a few things that cause a weld to be poor if you're continuously getting a bad weld. More than likely it's only a few things that could be wrong. And if you can quickly pinpoint those, you'll be back on track and be laying nice welds. So today we're using the Eastwood MIG-175. Uh, this is probably my favorite MIG welder that we offer. We do offer a MIG-250 that is a much more powerful unit than this. Uh, but as far as uh, cost and um, how much use I can get out of this, I really like the MIG-175. It's good uh, if you have 220. We also offer a 110 unit, the MIG-135, which is great for doing sheet metal work and medium fabrication, medium duty fabrication. But we're using the MIG-175, but it doesn't matter what brand welder you have. Uh, the, the stuff that I'm going to talk about today, it'll work for any type of MIG welder. So, you know, if you have a different brand, keep tuned in and hopefully you can learn something. So, on the MIG welder, um, the first thing I'm going to cover is what happens when you get uh, that the sound of the weld is probably the most important thing and what you want the sound to be like. Uh, the best thing, description I've ever heard that's been thrown around is you want the sound of frying bacon. So when you have your welder dialed in real good, the metal's clean, your joint's nice, uh, you'll get a nice sound of frying bacon, and that's when you know that you're dialed in real nicely. Um, that's easy to figure out what it sounds like. Uh, the other things, uh, when it's incorrect, is where you're gonna you know, have to listen and understand what, it's, what the machine's telling you. So I'm gonna turn it on, and we're gonna start with our first bad weld. I'll let you guys see what happens. So we got our gas turned on here. And I'm gonna mess up the dial here. We'll see what happens. So you may notice I, I, I seem like we always get that good question when we do videos or broadcasts. Um, I have my ground clamp way over here on the side of the table. Uh, that's because we have a nice, thick, heavy welding table or fab table that we use. We roll around the shop here. And because it's nice, clean metal, and the metal that I have down on the table is nice and clean, I can just put this ground off to the side of the table. There's not much resistance. It's going to go right, right to the piece, and we'll have no problem at all. If you're working on a car um, or, or a part, and your ground clamp, clamp isn't attached to a nice, clean piece of metal, maybe it's on something that's rusty, or it's on paint, you're going to get a poor weld because you're going to get a bad connection or you might now not be able to weld at all. So always make sure that you clean the metal as good as you can. Try and get your ground clamp as close as possible. Uh, in this instance, we're not too far away and this is so clean it's not an issue, but if you're on a car, if you're welding at the front of the car, don't put your ground clamp on the back bumper. It makes it too difficult for the current to transfer through there and it's just not going to be as good. So, you know, it's okay to put it you know, maybe in the rain tray of the car and you're working by the bumper area, it's not gonna be a problem, but try and get it fairly close. So I figured I'd cover that before we got that question uh, after we're going. So I got my machine dial set up here and I'm gonna do a weld and then I want everybody to listen to what it sounds like. 
That's the most important thing here. So what do we hear? Not a lot. Didn't he hear that frying bacon sound. What you could really hear, the majority of what you could hear there was the shielding gas coming out of, out of the MIG gun, out of the nozzle. That's mostly what you're hearing there. You're not hearing much of that frying bacon. That's because the heat on the machine or, or the amperage or volts, uh, how, depends how your machine reads, uh, is turned up real high on this machine. So I got it turned up probably like 80% of the way. And I have the wire speed here way down. I mean, I cranked this at an unrealistic setting, but I wanted to make it so you guys could really hear what's going on. So it was spitting a little bit, and you heard that hissing was really loud, and it was kind of jumping between the welds. Um, I'll turn it over here so you guys can see. But, yeah, I mean, you can actually see what you were hearing right here on the weld. If you learn how to read your weld, it, it kind of tells you what's going on. So Basically, we were heating up the, the, uh, the wire that's coming out, and it's melting it into the workpiece, but it's, it's melting it too quick. It was only wanting to burn back to the, to the tip of the, of the MIG, and that's why we got these jumps. It was a little bit came out, melted, and then it burnt back to the tip, and then a little bit all, more kind of fell off and melted. That's why I was doing that. So if you hear a loud gas sound and the, the wire starting to burn back to the tip, you can even see here, on the uh, on the edge on the end of my my nozzle here, that's a, that's basically what's happening each of those times. That little bit of a little bit of weld is kind of melting back into it, and then it gets close to the tip, and it's either going to just fall off onto the workpiece, or it's going to possibly weld itself right to the end of that that tip, the contact tip on the, on the mid gun, and then you're going to have to unscrew it and it's probably going to wreck it if you can't get it, if it welds it too, too much that tip, you're probably going to have to take the tip off, throw it away and get another one. So if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your wire is burning back up to the tip like that, making that sound, there's a couple of things that could cause it. The most common thing is the settings are wrong, where you have your temperature too high and your wire speed too low, and it's, you're blending those two things. Or another thing that I've seen that causes that is you have your your MIG set way too high. So I've seen it where you know you want to be down pretty close to the workpiece where you're almost touching the nozzle. But I've seen guys and gals that they hold their, their nozzle way up like this. So it's doing that and you're actually losing power, the power, you know, the resistance across that, the jump that is so great that you're losing that power. Um, it's just the same as if you put a long extension cord on your MIG welder that's causing the same type of thing. It's dropping the power of the welder and causing the same type of thing to happen. So those are the two things that could cause that. I'm going to... So you want to get that little BB on the end or ball on the end there. We want to cut that guy off. Uh, if you, it's always a good practice to cut off that little bit that gets on the end anytime because your first weld might be a little too cold because it has to burn off that additional ball of weld on the end there before you start welding. So if you start with a fresh cut on the wire, you're going to get a nice clean weld from the beginning to the end. Any questions as we're, as we're uh, going into the next one here? Um, yeah, one question. Sure. Uh, what about MIG welding outside? Do you have any suggestions? So we had a question about MIG welding outside or any suggestions for MIG welding outside. Um, MIG welding and oftentimes the term is, is used um, back and forth incorrectly, but flux core welding or wire welding, wire welding in general would kind of encompass flux core and MIG welding, which uses a gas. Uh, MIG welding, which uses a gas, is a little difficult to weld outside if, you, if there's any type of breeze at all. I know it's realistic. A lot of us, we don't have huge shops that we can work inside, so you may have to do some welding outside. The best thing to do is trying to block the, the wind as much as you can. So if you could put up a little tarp or something around you, or if you're welding in the car, 
you know, maybe close the doors up or something like that so you could keep the wind from blowing through too much. Uh, if it's really windy, um, the only option might be something that doesn't have shielding gas like a flux core, but you do have to realize that you're going to get not as clean of a weld. So I prefer MIG welding, so if best is to block around where you're welding or get the car inside. So that's a really good question. If you guys have any other ones, feel free to shoot them over to Randy and he'll, he'll get them uh, over to me so we can answer them on camera. <coughs> so next setting here, I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to do kind of the opposite settings here and show you what happens. I'm going to lay another bead across just below that first one. All right, so we're making a lot of sparks. This is what I'd call the patented bird poop weld. This is where you're making lots of lots of sparks and stuff's popping around and carry on but you just got a bunch of turds sitting on top of your metal. So we made a weld. I mean what looks like a weld here just below. But that weld has no penetration. So what I did is I turned our uh, voltage or our power or amperage again however your welder shows it down really low, maybe say 20%. And I have a wire speed cranked almost all the way up. And what's happening is the wire's coming out so fast, it doesn't have enough power to melt that wire. So it's just bouncing around, it's melting on top, and it's just kind of, it's just melting the wire, but it's not, it's not welding itself down into the surface and actually fusing into the metal. So a weld like this, if we were welding a joint, um, would have no structural integrity at all. I don't care if it's sheet metal or what you're doing. That weld is just going to sit on top. We could probably take a hammer and just tap that weld right off or if it was a joint it would just break apart and it's no good. So when you hear that again a couple of things could cause that but the biggest thing is you're going to have your wire speed cranked far too high and you're going to have your power turned too low. So you can start dialing in from there. What I would do is I take a test piece like this and I'm going to start dialing the, the power up a little bit. So 10, a 10 wire speed is kind of crazy unless we've got the machine running full out. So let's turn it down to like a six and a half or six. Oh, we'll turn it up to say H and a half. And I'm going to do another one. Let's see what, actually we'll go, let's go, because we were so far down that, we're going to go, let's go D, we'll go 4. Now there is settings inside the machine, the way the machine is turned so I can access it, you can't really see it, but on this inside here, this flap you can open up and we have the settings on the machines, on our MIG welders, so you can actually look and get yourself close. But I know the machine pretty well, so I can kind of lead you guys in the direction we're trying to go. So now we're, we cranked up the, the power just a little bit and the wire speed just a little bit. Now let's hear what it sounds like. Sounded a lot better. You got that frying bacon sound like we're looking for. Uh, on the back side here, you can see we got some, some penetration there. It's pretty good. So this is all just, this is one of our test pieces that we use for videos. So you get all kinds of welds on there where we're doing that. But this is a, you can see this one right here. I'm trying to lead Joe in the right direction. So right in here, you can see that's the penetration. Let me know when you got that pretty good and then we'll flip it over. And there's our weld that we left. So you can hear the sound was, it had that bacon frying sound. It was a lot better. Um, if I was welding this plate we have here, I think is 3 16 or 8 inch steel. I would probably go a little hotter uh, if I was welding this. 
So I'd probably crank it up even a little bit more than that. And, uh, and that would be about where I would set it. But you're starting to get that frying bacon sound. It's not spitting, it's not carrying on. Uh, if you're seeing a lot of sparks, excessive sparks, and big, um, like, flying piece of molten metal that are hitting and it's kind of exploding, that's when you are probably got your wire speed set a little too high because it's the shooting ex excess wire off onto the, uh, all over the place. It's going to probably get you on top of your head, too, because it's going to bounce over you, which isn't good. Any, any other questions we have as we're moving? Um, there's a, a Yannick on YouTube would like to know whatever happened to Project Pilehouse. <laughs> Somebody asked about uh, what happened to Project Pilehouse. Uh, Project Pilehouse is sitting at my house, not getting much attention. Uh, I've done a little bit of work to it, but uh, I have a little bit of car ADD, so it's been, uh, I got a bunch of stuff done to it. It's getting a little further, but now we're at the point of I'm doing a lot of the boring stuff, like setting door gaps and, um, and, and hood gaps and things like that that just aren't very fun. So I don't, I don't usually do too much posting about the, that particular project. But once we get a little bit closer, it'll probably be the point where I could start doing some body work and paint to it, which will be definitely worth everyone's interest. But right now I'm just tinkering away with it here and there. But I need to start working on a lot more. That's, I need a kick in the butt for that. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I'm going to show you another what happens. Uh, we're going to crank the gas shut. So I'm already telling you what the, how to resolve this problem. But uh, we see sometimes when people are running their gas too low. So I just, I'm just running out the gas. So when the gas is too low, uh, what, what I'm going to make happen here, a couple things could make it occur but the gas being too low or, or not turned up high enough or your bottle's just out, this is what's going to cause this. But I'll tell you a couple other things that can cause it once we, we do a weld here. So we got almost a frying bacon sound, but not quite. Um, and this, that's going to be this one right here, Joe, the bottom there. But you can see this one, it just looks like it's like something that came off of Mars or something. I don't know. It's got all kinds of pits in it. Uh, we got, you know, a weld. We could see where I was moving along with each of the, moving the puddle along. But there's all these pits in the weld. It just doesn't look like the one above it that's, you know, it's got more shape to it and is a little more... I guess you could say shiny, if you will. Uh, what's causing that in this instance is I turned the gas completely off, so it's getting zero shielding gas. So it's getting contaminants into that weld, and it's causing all those pits. You know, the contaminants, basically it's oxidizing as it's hitting almost, and it's getting impurities into the weld. It's causing those pits, and that's a problem. That's not going to have any structural integrity to the weld because of it having all those, uh, all those pits in it. Another thing that can cause that is... Um, improper uh, preparation of the weld of the weld joint. So MIG welding versus say TIG welding is um, you, it's a lot more flexible that you can get away with welding something that might have a tiny bit of surface rust or I, I know I've done it with welding floors in a car that maybe there's a little bit of seam sealer left next to where you're welding and you kind of just brush it away and you, you plug along because you don't feel like cleaning it the perfect bare metal or a little bit of paint, you can get by with it. But if you start seeing pitting like that, that stuff that's around it that you didn't clean properly, you start seeing pits, that might be one of the reasons. Uh, MIG welding isn't a miracle welder. It can't weld through seam sealer, undercoating, paint. You know, it, it, it can burn through it a little bit, but that stuff you're burning off is going to end up into your weld. It's going to cause pits like that. It may have a similar sound as well because it's getting a dirty weld. So you know, check your shielding gas, check and make sure that your weld um, air seam and everything around it is a nice clean area. The cleaner the better anytime you're welding, but MIG welding can get away with a little bit more than say TIG welding, but you still should try and get into practice of cleaning it 
as best you can. So that was the different, you know, it has a slightly different sound. The weld looks a little different. You can read it and see, okay, I got pits. I'm not getting enough shielding gas or the metal isn't clean enough. Which of the two things are happening? So the, the shielding gas is an easy one to figure out. You can just turn, the, you can just turn your, to your gauges and check. Um, so I have this set about, the CFH on this is about, uh, what do I have it at now currently? I have it a little higher, I have it around 18 on this. Um, anywhere from 10 to 15 is pretty good. Uh, if you get below 10, what happens is you have a drop when you hit the trigger and you're going to lose some shielding gas. So if you set it at 5, it's going to drop down to like 2 and you're not going to have enough shielding gas. So you set it around you know, 10 to 15, it's going to drop to 12 to 8, somewhere in there. And you should be okay for as long as your metal's pretty clean and it's not windy outside. So we'll set the welder up one more time, let you hear what it sounds like for a little bit better of a weld. So I'm going to crank this up a little higher like I would like it. Any other questions before I do another weld? Yeah, yes. Um, let me scroll up here, if you give me a second. Uh, the Marcus on YouTube would like to know, is there any difference in the weld when using 024 to 030 wire, the different wire thicknesses? <laughs> so Mark, asked a good question. Uh, he asked if there was a difference between uh, 024 wire or 030 wire. So that would be the thickness of the wire um, that's being used. Uh, the thickness of the wire would change how you set your machine up, uh, and, but it wouldn't really change how well it welds. Now you want to make sure that you pick a wire that works best for whatever you're welding. So I wouldn't really use an 023 or 024 wire for say doing um, chassis fabrication or something like that. It's a little small of a wire, you're going to want to jump up to an 030 um, or even an 035, something like that. So if I was doing sheet metal work, which is um, you know, what a lot of people are doing in, in, in our space of the welding world, an 023 wire is going to be better for doing sheet metal work. That's because it has, uh, it's a smaller diameter, therefore it takes less heat to um, to melt the wire into the metal, which means you're putting less heat into the panel, which in sheet metal world is the best thing you can do. So make sure you try and match the wire to what you're doing. Uh, our welders at least have a little chart in here that kind of gives you an idea of the thickness of the metal that you're welding and the wire and the settings. So you can get an idea of what's acceptable. We'll have it marked off if you, you know, if you look at our chart for an 023, it's, it's probably going to be marked off um, or you're going to have the welder cranked at a funny setting to weld a thicker gauge. So uh, just keep an extra spool wire on your cart and that you can swap them out pretty easily. That's a good question though. Any other ones? Yes. Lucas Tenadia on YouTube says, Hola, Power Metal de O Duso O de Espressar, que medida del alambre es recomendado usar? I'm a little rough on my Spanish. I haven't had it since uh, college. So if I could read it, I might uh, I might be able to. Okay, you're no uh, we may have to get a translator in yeah, here for we, future. Because we, we're getting posts from all over the world on YouTube. Oh, it's great. So my it's, my, my Espanol is no bueno. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as good as I get. We can try to answer it later with someone else here from Yeah, we could do our best. We got we have some um, some reps in our call center that do speak Spanish, but Unfortunately, here in the studio, uh, Spanish is not so good. So uh, and we'll do our best to get back to you all with an answer on that one. And just one other question from Facebook was, uh, um, what gas are you using for the MIG welding? Okay, so a good question. I, I kind of jumped over that. Just because you had mentioned flux core earlier. Okay. Yeah, someone had asked what gas I'm using. If, again, if you're using flux core wire um, and you have your machine set up for flux core, there's no gas required. You can just weld, set your machine up, put your ground on, and you can weld. The bottles we have over here, I'm going to try and turn this. I don't know if Joe can see, just so these guys can see what they're looking at on the bottle. So your bottle is going to tell you pretty much exactly what's in there. So this, this cart here is pretty awesome. It, you can hold our TIG welder and our MIG welder in one shot, two bottles. So we got an argon, it's 100% argon. So this is what you would use for TIG welding. And if your big welder has a spool gun, like ours does uh, offer, you would be using that for aluminum only on the MIG welder. 
Um, if you're using the, the MIG welder for doing pretty much everything else, your bottle is going to be a mixed, uh, an argon mix. So the bottle we have here, you can see, I don't know if you can get in close enough, but it actually tells you the mixture right on it. Um, the most common is what we have is 7525. So it's going to have car, uh, argon and CO2. So 7525, I've seen, um, you know, 8020 before, but that's what's most common at our, our welding supply store. And for most automotive stuff, that's going to be fine. If you start getting into some more technical, or I wouldn't say technical, some higher end welding, you may, you may find that you can use a different mix, but you do use a mix when welding with a MIG welder like that, whether it's 8020, 7525, you're going to use some kind of mix commonly. Uh, you do not want to use 100% argon when using a MIG welder on uh, normal steel. Uh, only use that for, for when you're welding aluminum. So that's a good question. I skipped over that. Any others? Okay, cool. So I got the welder set up here a little higher. I'm going to try and do a longer weld so you guys can hear the sound that we have. Got my gas back on. And I got these little pliers that we, that we offer in, um, that are pretty handy. They're kind of called MIG pliers because they're handy for, you can cut wire. They have a little indent here in the center that you can grab onto the tip and actually remove. Well, let's see if I joke, none of them talking about it. Um, there's a little indent at the top there that you can grab on and you can loosen the tip that's inside here in, that's uh, underneath of the nozzle. And also in the bottom here, there's another little grippy area that you can use that has a knurled uh, section. So these are great for just overall use when using a MIG wire, pulling wire out, cutting it. But I like to use the, the pliers as a guide for the length that I use for the, for the stick out. You can turn it one way, have further, more stick out, or for what I'm using today, I'm using it and I'm cutting it uh, pretty close with the, uh, the thickness of the pliers, which is great for getting your stick out correct. All right, so got our set, welder set up. And just listen for that sound is what we're listening for here. So you can hear that the frying bacon sound was uh, very clear there. The other thing you might notice versus when we had the machine set up wildly incorrect, there's not near as much debris and sparks flying off, not as far at least, as when you have your machine set up closer to what it needs to be. So MIG welding does produce sparks and, you know, and debris, if you will, coming off of the weld. But you don't want it to be, it shouldn't be shooting way up over your head and up underneath your helmet as much. It doesn't create the same type of debris. You shouldn't see little BBs that are still molten red hot floating around on the table. Uh, that might be a, a sign that you have your machine set up incorrectly. So that's what it should sound like. Listen for that sound. Practice your technique. We have a bunch of videos on uh, our YouTube channel. If you're watching this on Facebook, you can find our YouTube channel. If you just search Eastwood Co., that's our username. We have tons of videos. We have more videos where I've gone in more in-depth than some of the other guys here have gone more in-depth on technique for practicing your, your technique for welding, um, how to set the welder up, and everything like that. But I just wanted to show you guys a quick little uh, tech video on how to listen and, and look at your welds and try and diagnose them to get them a little better. Uh, do we have any other questions yeah. before we... Yeah, um, well, do, do you know how, how thick is O2O metal? O2O... Is it on the chart on the welder? Because uh, we've got the, uh, we translated. So the question was... He's going to be asking probably millimeters. Ah, uh, he's, if he's the metal's yeah, o, O2O thick, uh, what would the, uh, what wire would you use? Yeah, and I, um, and I thought maybe it was on that chart. Well, no, he might be, no, he's, you know, he's, you're correct. No, because um, no, it would be like six mil or nine mil. Um, 
unless he's asking for 20, I don't know off the top of my head. I should know. Because um, 020 is, that's, that's really thin. Because uh, 20 gauge is like 040, and I think 18 gauge is 036 or 035 is 18 gauge. So that's, holy crap, that's probably like 26 so gauge. That's super thin. That's really thin. Um, for something that thin, if he if that wasn't a misprint, unless he meant 20 gauge. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. That's probably he probably meant 20 gauge because yeah. that's the. Yeah. So 20 gauge, uh, as Randy knows, and he's he's typing in for 20 gauge, uh, 023 is or, or 024 depending where you buy it, uh, is generally what you use for 20 gauge. Uh, the, the person that we translated here um, that asked said 020 .020, which. From memory, that's going to be like 26 gauge or something crazy. I don't know what they're building that's that thin, but you're not going to really be able to weld it with a MIG welder very easily. Um, something like that, you're probably going to have to go to um, a TIG welder that has a varied, a varied amperage that you can really run it at a real low amperage. Um, so you would but, probably use 030, 035 wire? Uh, for 20 gauge, okay. uh, 023 is what I like to oh. use for, um, for if, he's doing, if he's doing 20 gauge. Yeah, um, but I don't. I don't know. I'd like to feel free to, to message back. Maybe we lost it in translation too. Who knows? Um, but uh, cool. Any other questions? Yeah, we have one other question. Sure. Um, what are the effects of a tight or loose drive wheel? Is that easy to show? Uh, yeah, we could try and. Well, I'll, I'll explain it. It's probably easier to explain because it's going to be like one of the other ones. Um, so what, what was asked was, what was the effect of a tight or loose drive wheel? So I'm going to turn this welder and unplug it so you guys can see it. That's a good one. Um, so inside the machine here, you got your drive motor with your wheels, and you can tighten. On ours, the knob's right here, where we can tighten this knob and we can, and we can uh, put that little, little wheel tighter down on the on the filler or on the, uh, the, the wire. And if you crank it too tight, uh, or if you have this knob here for the actual spool too tight, it's gonna slow down the wire speed too much. More than what the setting is, it's gonna bog the machine down. It's gonna give you that effect like we were talking about in the beginning, which with the wire speed's too slow, it's kind of skipping and you hear a gas sound. That's what's gonna cause that because it's gonna, it's gonna mess up the settings on the machine. It's gonna be working the motor real hard, but it's not going to be going very, very fast. The opposite, if you have your spool too loose, well, your wire is just going to unravel. You're just going to have a problem where your wire is going to unravel. That's a whole other mess of problems. But if you have your knob here too loose, what's going to happen is your, is your little wheel is going to be doing burnouts on your MIG wire. So it's going to be slipping. So it's not going to be moving. Um, it's going to be the same type of thing where the wire is not going to move as quick as it should. So that could cause a, an issue. Um, one other thing to mention that I just thought of that I've seen happen is when you do crank this down too tight, what can happen is it actually presses down on your, uh, the, these wheels are strong enough that they can actually press down on the MIG wire and put flat spots in it. And I've, I've seen that where we've had customers that actually return a welder and causing a problem and there's flat spots on the spool wire. So what's happening is it goes through the liner and through the tip it's getting caught and it's jumping or it's getting stuck in the, in, the, uh, in the line or inside or inside the gun. So a good thing to check, if you have this too tight, I would pull, you figure out that you have this too tight, I would cut off the wire behind the motor here, pull out all the excess that's in, it's actually within the liner and start with a fresh piece of wire. Because if you're, if you're crimping that, that means all these pieces in the whole, this whole section here is all have little crimps in it causing that problem. So that, that, can, uh, that can affect something, but you're, it's usually going to make the wire not come out as fast as it should and cause that. It's either going to get stuck or it's going to cause that, uh, that skipping that we showed in the beginning. Any other? Uh, that's it. Cool. All right, well, that's all our questions. Thank you guys for commenting and sharing um, and joining the conversation. As always, if there's anything that you would like to see, whether it's an Eastwood uh, tool uh, in action. Uh, let us know. 
or if there's any projects you'd like to see, we're happy to hear them and we'll do our best to get them on camera live for you guys to see and, and interact with us. So thanks for watching. I'll catch you guys next week.